William Shakespeare, enlarging on Sir Thomas More's story, went even further in perpetuating the image of an evil Richard. Actor Robert O'Mahony. The part of uh, Shakespeare's Richard III has always been incredibly popular with actors. David Garrick made his reputation with it. Edmund Keane, one of his favorite roles. Irving, Olivier. And whatever people actually think was the true nature of the historical Richard, I don't think you're ever going to get rid of this image of him as the bottled spider, as the Red King, as the evil, evil monster. Shakespeare was a writer of fiction. He was a writer of historical fiction. And he made up the plots in order to suit his particular characters. And, of course, he based them on some historical facts, but uh, he accepted the Tudor version of Richard III because there was very strict censorship at the time, and if he had not, his play would never have been performed and he would have been thrown into prison. Not content with creating one of the most villainous characters in literature, Shakespeare makes Richard deformed, physically. He gives him a hump, he gives him a withered arm. Shakespeare makes Richard lay bare his character, his motives and his intentions in the very opening speech of the play, when he turns to the audience and he says, now is the winter of our discontent, made glorious summer by this sun of York, and all the clouds that lowered upon our house in the deep bosom of the ocean buried. Grim-visaged war hath smoothed his wrinkled front, and now, instead of mounting barbed steeds to fright the souls of fearful adversaries, he capers nimbly in his lady's chamber to the lascivious pleasing of a loop. I, that am not shaped for sportive tricks, nor made to court an amorous looking glass. I, that am rudely stamped, and want love's majesty to strut before a wanton ambling nymph. I, that am curtailed of this fair proportion, cheated of feature by dissembling nature, deformed, unfinished, sent before my time into this breathing world, scarce half made up, and that's so lamely and unfashionable the dogs bark at me as I halt by them. The medieval mind thought that a deformed body indicated an evil person, a deformed mind. It was to the interests of the Tudors to suggest that he was a villain, and they therefore made up a physical deformity in order to back this case. And therefore, since I cannot prove a lover to entertain these fair, well-spoken days. I am determined to prove a villain and hate the idle pleasures of these days. Plots have I laid, inductions dangerous, by drunken prophecies, libels, and dreams, to set my brother Clarence and the king in deadly hate, the one against the other. And if King Edward be as true and just as I am subtle, false, and treacherous. This day should Clarence closely be mewed up about a prophecy which says that G of Edward's heirs, the murderer, shall be. This was, this was entirely invented after uh, his death, and also the story about the withered arm. Well, now, how on earth could a man uh, with a withered arm ride a horse and wield a, a battle axe? Barely two years after gaining the crown, Richard was forced to fight to keep it. Henry Tudor exiled in France, landed on English soil and raised an army to lay claim to the English throne. Richard's forces met the Tudors in the field at Bosworth. At a critical moment, Richard, famous strategist in battle, the fighting lord of the north, made his decision. He spurred his horse and charged headlong into the midst of his enemies. Bosworth to save his crown, Richard III thundered into the midst of his enemies seeking to bring down his adversary, Henry Tudor. But one of Richard's closest allies, Lord Stanley, defecting at the last moment, intercepted Richard within sight of his goal.
not even Richard's enemies ever claimed that he lacked courage or skill in battle. But treachery within his own ranks brought him down. If Richard had killed to gain the crown, now it was all for nothing. In the two years of his short reign, he had lost his much beloved son, his wife, and now his kingdom and his life. His last cry was treason. On Richard's death, Henry Tudor became king, and a strange silence fell regarding the fate of the princes. Twenty years later, Henry ordered the execution of Sir James Tyrrell for treason. Afterwards, he even waited a further two months, then suddenly said that Tyrrell had confessed to the murder of the princes at Richard's command. Although there's no evidence of such a confession, it became the source for the stories of Richard's guilt. But if Richard was not guilty, who was? Henry VII had very good reason to have the princes murdered because he'd become king by battle, by beating Richard at Bodsworth. His claim to the throne wasn't very good and the princes had a better claim. So Henry Tudor, who became Henry VII, may well have found the boys alive and murdered them himself. He did have other people who were in the royal line um, put out of the way in the tower, imprisoned or even executed on trumped-up charges. The only thing that makes me think that perhaps he was innocent is that uh, maybe the princes weren't alive for him to have them murdered when he came to the throne. Before you have a murderer, you have to have a murder. And there is no evidence that the princes were murdered. They may have been. They simply disappeared. And so the story rested for almost 200 years. Then in 1547, some workmen found what appeared to be the bones of two children under a stairway at the base of the tower. Believing them to be the remains of the princes, King Charles I had them sealed in an urn and placed in Westminster Abbey. Ironically, in the chapel of Henry VII, who might well have been their murderer. Nearly two centuries later, in 1933, the urn was opened and the bones were examined by experts. We've got some pictures of the bones here and um there is the almost complete skull of the elder child, and this shows the rather more broken one of the younger boy. Here are the thigh bones of the two children, and you can see that one is longer than the other, and the jawbone of Edward VI. The, the examination of those bones in the abbey nearly 50 years ago proved nothing. It didn't prove the sex of the children, they could be female. It didn't prove the century uh, with which they lived, and it didn't prove their age. And uh, I hope that there will be another and more scientific investigation. Certainly we are pressing the dean and chapter to have them re-examined. Once somebody has been buried in the abbey, been given Christian burial, um, they are in a slightly different position from bones preserved in a museum. And you cannot keep on poking into bones that have been given Christian burial inside a church. I think they're reluctant to re-examine them because they're reluctant to disturb royal tombs, but the whole question here is whether they are royal tombs. Are the bones in the abbey those of the princes? Were the princes murdered at all? If so, is Henry VII, who gained and kept the crown, responsible for their deaths? Is Richard the most maligned king in history, or truly Shakespeare's arch-villain? Perhaps new dating methods, or a forgotten scroll in some dusty library, may eventually give the answer to this intriguing mystery of the Tower of London. The warders at the Tower say that sometimes, in the early dawn, the figures of two small, lost boys walk anxiously hand in hand on the Tower Green.
Are these the princes, and for whom do they search? Coming up next, In Search Of continues with a close-up look at claims about the powers of the water divining rod. 